Good evening, readers. It's... You just made a noise in my recording. <laughs> Good evening, readers. It's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf, and welcome to another bookish breakfast, except this is a bookish bedtime because I filmed this this morning and then I realised that I left out something um, key to what I was trying to say and then I meant to record again and just things happened. It doesn't really matter to you when I record this. But it is another um, bookish ramble, essentially, about the wonderfulness that is Jane Austen July. And this week for Jane Austen July, I have mostly been reading What Matters in Jane Austen by John Mullen. And I am waving a Kindle at you that doesn't even have the cover on. Um, so What Matters in Jane Austen um, is a selection of, um, I suppose each chapter is like an essay um, in itself um, about the about different themes in Jane Austen's work and um, drawing across all six of her major novels and occasionally dabbling into Lady Susan um, that John Mullen has put together um, in order to like further enlighten um, Austen's works for us like uh, Jane lovers um, and it was written a good few years ago now and it has been very popular on booktube and elsewhere um, and I feel like everyone has read it before me and loved it before me and I think part of the downside of, of finally getting to read a book that everyone has re already read and loved is that everyone's told you all the good bits but not told you the, the less good bits. I, I really am loving this and I feel like it's a treat because it's like I'm reading all six novels at once and I keep, it's like I have this feeling of, oh, I really want to get back to my book. Like I want to get to the next part of the book and then I realize that I'm not thinking of the Jane Austen book that I'm actually reading, which is Northanger Abbey, um, right here. Um, but I'm thinking of like all of them, just all of them, um, and it, it's just made me want to, to just read all of them in a month and I don't think I physically could um, unless I had the whole month off. Um, I think Northanger Abbey is going to be enough for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying it and um, I'm using it to inspire a little um, series called the Mysteries of Udolfo Vlogs. I don't often shamelessly plug my content, but if you are watching this and for some reason you haven't seen the Mysteries of Udolfo um, one, just watch the first one. It's only three minutes long. I, I hope it would um, raise a, a small smile at least. Um, so anyway, to focus on what matters in Jane Austen, I feel like for a start each chapter is written very much like an essay that to me is the kind of essay that I might have written or that one might write um, for like college or university, like the structuring of it in terms of the repetition of arguments um, is more adapted to um, presenting an academic discourse than it is to um, the enjoyment of a casual reader. Um, I think that's good in terms of making a very clear point and um, kind of hammering it home I guess um, but it's not necessarily always the most satisfying reading experience um, often your kind of aha moment is as he introduces his idea and then you just kind of get this kind of like okay okay yeah you're just backing it up and backing it up um, which is good because it allows you to see how he's evidencing his his arguments um, but sometimes I feel like I would enjoy it more if there was a little bit more of surprise later in in each chapter um, I sometimes feel like, like in order to write this book, he had to have an insane level of knowledge about um, the six major novels. Um, and he's there's frequent references to the letters. There's also references to um, other literary um, scholars working in the area of Jane Austen. So the knowledge that he must have of both the books and the academia and resources and general paraphernalia surrounding the books, um, is at an, an incredibly high level and one that not many people could probably um, pretend to also achieve. But as somebody who really, really loves Austen and has read most of her books multiple times, um, I notice things that he seems to have missed or somehow discounted. Um, and that I find a little bit odd. Um, like I, I, I think that his evidence is really, really well um, produced, but his oversight sometimes um, surprise me. For instance, there's one chapter where he talks about death and he kind of says that um, the only character who actually dies during a Jane Austen book is Mrs. Churchill. Um, I think he must be meaning that the only character who dies during the main plot of a Jane Austen novel is Mrs. Churchill. Spoilers for Emma. More later on in the video as well, actually. Um, 
because for instance, um, Mr. Norris, to me, Mr. Norris dies within Mansfield Park, because Mansfield Park starts when Fanny Price um, moves to Mansfield, and Mr. Norris dies after Fanny has moved to Mansfield. So Mr. Norris dies during Mansfield Park. He dies before the major events of the novel, um, but his death is still discussed as a present moment event by the characters during the time in which it has just recently happened. And we did meet Mr. Norris as a character before he died, not as a major well-defined character, but he was a presence in the story. Um, and they're like little details like that, that, um, like for instance, um, Mr. Dashwood, Eleanor and Marianne's dad, we meet him as a living man before he dies um, and things like that. Like, um, I felt like that was a little bit lacking. Um, <laughs> then he has a tendency to lean quite heavily on some scenes and completely neglect others um, and the scenes that he might repeatedly um, refer to to me aren't always the most important scenes so for instance what is it with dr perry setting up a carriage honestly every single theme he seems to find a way to link it back to dr perry's carriage and I, I just I just don't know if I can take it anymore. Like, yes, Dr. Perry set up a carriage. Yes, Frank Churchill, Emma, spoilers, um, made a blunder in telling people that he knew that Frank Churchill was setting up a carriage. But like it's not the turning point of Emma. It's an it's it's a clue and it's an important clue. It's one of the clearest clues that we get, but it is not um the massive revelation that he seems to think it is. Um it's just one in a pattern of a series of events that shows the reader that something odd is going on with Frank Churchill and he's not exactly who he seems to be um, and that perhaps there is something and um, th there is just this indication that there might be something between him and Jane but it, it's it's nothing earth-shattering it's just another little lair um, or a little kink on the journey towards seeing Frank Churchill and Jane as a as an existing couple um, Whereas he just seems to see it as something that, that's like this big revelation. To me, the turning point of, in Emma is more to do with, um, like, to me, the, 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 the real um, sort of powerful moment is um, Mr Knightley um, addressing Emma and telling her that, just confronting her about her behaviour and telling her that it's badly done. Um, and for saying there's a whole chapter on this in, like, referring to people by their first names, I find it interesting that the the Box Hill scene where Emma's name goes from being the subject of a pun or a riddle to being like the word that Knightley uses when he um, condemns Emma. The phrase badly done Emma is from the adaptations. I always think that is how it's written in the novel. It isn't, but he does directly um, address her in that speech by her first name twice. Um, I think if you're gonna write a chapter on characters using people's first names, and yet somehow not seem to notice the way that Mr. Knightley uses Emma's first name. I d yeah, I just, I just found that an odd omission. Also talking about the use of um, first names and nicknames, um, he talked about people using um, Fanny Price's first name, but kind of omitted to mention that Fanny is a diminutive nickname of Francis, like Fanny, Price has this name that is like a, a dignified, respectable, um, full-length name, and yet everyone in Mansfield, universally, every single person, um, calls her Fanny, which is more like the kind of name that a servant would have, like Sally or Patty, um, like a, a, a short, informal, um, not well-attended-to kind of name. Um, whereas on the flip side, other characters that have nicknames, say, for instance, um, Elizabeth Bennet and her sister Kitty, um, Kitty is being short for Catherine, like, those names are markers of the affection that they have within their family, and both, all different forms of their names are used um, according to the different um, scenarios that they're in, so um, Lizzie is frequently called Elizabeth, but um, the, the Lizzie shows, like, is illustrative of her family relationships. Yeah, there was another one that I particularly wanted to mention, which is another aspect, I suppose, that I wanted to mention, which is that um, I think this kind of criticism is enabled by modern technology um, to a certain extent. And I think um, John Marlon has enabled his his analysis by occasionally using the search function on you can get a like a, a Gutenberg ebook of 
of the, the, the text of a story and type in a word and see how many times it's used and track those points and and look at how it's used and, and make analysis based analyses based on that. Um, and I think this can be a wonderful tool because it means that he can really quickly just find like, oh, how, how many people blush in this novel or, or, or something like that. But you can tell when it's been used and in particular you can tell when it's been overused or misapplied. Um, so sometimes it's just not very interesting to have a list of um, the number of people who blush. But in particular, um, going back to Emma, and we've just watched the 2009 miniseries with Romola Galactica, Romola Garay, which is the best adaptation of Emma um, that exists. Um, just watch it if you haven't already, it's perfect. Um, so I think that's like fresh on my mind at the moment. But he talks about how um, important blunders are in Emma, and that is true. Um, and then he goes on to say that the this is illustrated by the fact that the word blunder is used a whole 16 times. And yes, that is true. I checked. It's actually 15 according to mine, but but that's fine. I'll, I'll give him that. Um, but I think, I, d I don't think using the frequency of the use of the word blunder as evidence for its importance um, is really an adequate form of analysis when you consider that, for instance, just picking a couple of words that I thought were important in Emma, um, the word blind comes up 26 times because Emma is blind to the things that are going on um, and different characters are blinded to different ex extents. Blind is used um, in the sense of a blind as in a trick as well as in the sense of visual blindness. Um, and then we've got also like Mrs. Bates and her broken glasses and things like that. Like, like that is a theme that is pretty strong. The word truth or true truth and truly adds up to over a hundred times. I didn't go through and check like all of those um, specific like instances because you know I've got other things to do and I'm not a literary critic. Um, but in, in a story where falsehood and mistakes um, are two things that get in the way of the truth um, and some characters kind of um, have a kind of a claim to speak the truth such as Mr Knightley um, then I think that that is important. So just like when you put that into context, although blunder is an unusual word, it being used 16 times isn't actually all that amazing. Um, so yeah, so I felt that was just a little bit lacking. Um, I am just coming up to the end of the amount of time that I am able to record on my phone at the moment. So um, let me know what you think and whether you agree with any of this and what your thoughts were if you have read What Matters in Jane Austen. And yeah, what kinds of, um, what the highlights of the book were, I suppose, because I've been a little bit um, critical. I have really enjoyed it. Oh, excuse me. Um, and yeah, I will just continue to be reading The Mysteries of Udolf Udolfo <laughs> and Northanger Abbey. I'm very, very nearly finished in um, What Matters in Jane Austen. And yeah, watching numerous wonderful adaptations with my partner. It's a delight. I, I like that Jane Austen July just allows me license to do that for a whole month every year. Um, take care everyone and yeah, good night.